ahead and call the meeting to order at 531. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is to uh, welcome guests uh, that are attending tonight. So if there are particular issues that people want to, are of interest to you or that you want to address at some point, uh, it's useful to either let me know or we can circulate a list for people to, to sign up on as well if they want to. Speak to a particular issue. Did you shake it up? Are there any uh, agenda recommendations or board comments? Yeah, let me see. Here. Sorry. <laughs> The agenda shows the policy committee giving the report and offering our charge, but we haven't actually met. And I would like to table that until the next meeting of the poll so that we can have a meeting and discuss it. I'm asking that that be tabled. Okay. Uh, and Brian, yeah. Can I just. What's that? Uh, I think you still kind of mine too. I don't know if this is more of just a, a meeting horns type of thing. Is it an appropriate time to, to bring it up at this moment? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'd just like to remind everyone that as we sit up here, there are things that run across these tables and um, conversations that are had, um, perhaps intend to be in private, are not. They're public and picked up on recording. And so I just encourage us all to be mindful of that and respectful um, of others who are talking at the time and what we're saying, uh, because that's reported a lot. Uh, so just one of the other. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, any other uh, revisions to the agenda or comments? We have time on our agenda for public uh, comments and correspondence. Um, again, I think I will assume that most people out of here because of interest in, in Act 46, unless someone has another separate burning issue, they can let me know by raising their hand now. Seeing no one raising their hand, I'll assume that. So uh, generally, we provide uh, time for public comment after the board has discussed a particular issue, so we can open up the floor uh, after we've had a chance to have some Act 46 updates if anyone of our guests would like to, uh, to comment on that. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of September 26th? So moved. Floor. Is there a second? Okay. All right. Is there any discussion? The minutes are on page five. Yeah. 
that, I think that was about an inter enrollment. Uh, we had, at the first meeting, provided a whole bunch of information that was similar to what we had in the 706 B committee to each other, so there wasn't, there wasn't much. There was a lot of data exchange from where it had it, even though we both, uh, Twinfield School District and Washington, which is what the law is. At the end of the second meeting, it came to the conclusion that I was asked for an outline to be drafted of what it would take, no matter what the governance structure were, so really looking at the SU level, to merge the two, the Washington Central and Twinfield School District together. So that had been passed to Mark and myself as superintendents, uh, and we are bringing together our staff from Central Office to look at those and put together that outline, and that's about a week ago. We are meeting in about a week. So it's probably going to be about two weeks out before we have that produced. Other Scott? Yeah. Scott. Yeah. Scott. Thanks, Bill. Um, do you have any back channel indications as to what might be the final disposition for the No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any uh, additional comments from me, Stephen or Scott? If you participate in the meetings, it's okay. There are no just one call for up to you. That, from my perspective, that pretty much covers it. Patrick was very interested in the game plan, timeline, um, but aren't we all? Uh, are there any questions for uh, Bill or Scott or Stephen about uh, these conversations? Uh, 3.2.2 is the uh, articles of agreement, specifically the subcommittee that was established to uh, look at them. So, floor. So we, we had a meeting uh, on Wednesday, and uh, does everybody know who is in which committee? I can just update on that. That might be helpful. Uh, the articles of agreement committee is uh, Chris Winters, Dorothy, Matthew, Chris McBay, Carrie, and myself. We, the first thing we did, we elected a chair, and I will be chairing that committee. And we came up with a list of questions for, for Bill to go back to both the, the AOE and to Chris to try to figure out all the date deadlines for, for us to be able to respond properly. So I don't know if I should go through there might be too much information, but basically is when we want to have uh, the meetings, assuming if they consolidate us, if we have to have a public meeting with, uh, with our communities, and we also have to, we will have 90 days to do articles of agreement if we don't want to uh, just do the articles of agreement that they gave us, even though we would be using those as a, as a base for any conversation. So there's, we had a lot of questions from, uh, uh, this would be a recommendation for the transitional board. It, so it was pretty much an organizational meeting. We're meeting again next Tuesday at, uh, what was it, 5? 5.30. 5.30, uh, 530 and we came up with some dates. I don't know if Bill, you were gonna try to have maybe some dates for today or for next meeting? For, for the next meeting. For the we're next meeting. Yeah. A, a more detailed calendar than what the boards have seen before that's coming through the executive. Yeah. for a calendar of timelines based on the draft uh, articles of agreement. So if you read through the articles of agreement in page 21, 22, and 23, there's really like an outline and an article eight. Uh, we're not gonna take the time to do that right now. There's a pretty, there, it's pretty prescribed what we have to do and what we're trying to do is just figure out uh, the end date so that we can work our way backwards and make sure we have something okay, for everybody to review and to, you know, we have to take into consideration town meeting day and also that we think January 18th is the last day to give anything to our town clerks too. So we're figuring out all of that. Is that accurate? I think I covered it. Uh, any follow-up questions for the board? Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. See, I will go 
to uh, 3.2.3, uh, which is the debt issue. And uh, of course, we formed another subcommittee to, uh, to explore uh, this issue in this article. Debt committee met on Monday night, yesterday. Um, we uh, had a lot of conversations that, you know, sort of extra conversations we've had over the last two years or so. Um, we discussed with Bill gathering some detailed information on uh, the debt and value of the facilities. So Dylan's uh, folks will be gathering that information. Um, we quickly realized that um, we either don't have a charge from this board or the charge is um, very wide open. So I, we, we discussed a little bit that we fear that without something more specific, we are unsure if we're going to go through something this board that is um, helpful. Um, but um, we did um, discuss different um, proposals that we could come up with. However, we did, with each one, we did identify that even if we came up with a proposal that the five towns could agree to, uh, it's unclear that there is, it's unclear whether there's a mechanism in the law right now to allow that. So we kind of just kept coming back to that. And um, um, we could do some simple things like getting a second opinion, a legal, sec a second legal opinion. Um, that's something that we can pursue or consider that. We don't have a next week it's scheduled by the end of our time. was a great sermon. I, I just like to add to it that from, from my perspective, uh, and this is perhaps also in connection with the previous discussion of articles committee subcommittee, um, that in the default articles, Article 5 is, from my perspective, flatly unacceptable. And as it stands, it cannot stand. <laughs> Um, and there has to be some, if we are going to be forced into merger, there has to be some um, proper solution to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just note quickly that uh, I think the, the draft default articles committee came to a uh, rough conclusion that our, our probable work was going to be to draft articles of agreement um, for our own uh, school system uh, that we could, um, you know, consider and have a committee vote on and potentially have our electorate vote on as well. Um, and that the, our, our thought at least, and it may not jive with the members of the, the tech committee, I'm not sure, but our hope, anyway, we thought was that uh, you know, the deck committee would take special charge of Article 5, particularly uh, recognizing that you know, many people find problematic and sort of best. So I just want to offer that. By way of a, a more specific charge, agree on everything. <laughs> I agree with him on this, that um, the article on debt is the way it's worded is not satisfactory. Um, so my thinking for the subcommittee um, was around coming up with what that committee felt was um, the most viable alternative what is mandated that would create more equity. Okay, 
how to do the demand, I wouldn't want to be too specific. I think there are some resolutions around uh, debt that have been utilized by some other mergers that might serve as a starting point. But, Even though we don't have flexibility with that, my feeling is if, if we're going to dig our heels in and fight somewhere, that's where we dig our heels in and fight. Um, so coming up with something that could potentially be viable and, and relatively, this is also sheet washing for you, that, that <laughs> would be acceptable with an existing law outside of that mandated you can't do it there are some things I think they can be done with an existing law that might not get completely there but can get us closer to what we have put yeah and I guess I would just also add briefly that uh, the executive committee has decided to meet more often uh, over the next six weeks or so. So our next meeting is, I believe, November 6th uh, uh, in the central office building, and then we're meeting again either right before or right after the Thanksgiving holiday uh, before our next SE meeting, which will be December 5th. Um, so if the debt committee, if it would be at all helpful to consult with a wider group of people, or if there's like a spending decision to be made, for example, if there's going to you want to consult with a second attorney or something like that. There's opportunities, I guess, to kind of check in at least with the executive committee, again, if you feel that's useful. I, I guess I'm trying, I'm offering that up because you know, I understand the, um, that there's not like a hardwired charge, you know, with very specific wording. But I'm not sure we have the time, you know, to take that up tonight and try to hash it out the wordsmith one. Um, so I guess I'm hoping that the, what you've heard is is uh, maybe enough to move forward. Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah. This is one point where you and I are going to disagree. Okay. I think without a charge, the committee will be afloat. And I think we'll be, a what? We'll be afloat. afloat. And I think that you need to, the board needs, they don't need to get extremely specific, um, but I think they need a charge. Just as the subcommittee on the articles had a charge to consider wording and other, other possible articles. It, it took us a while to work through just to get, the, I think that's what we, kind of we're all over the place without at least some focus. It could be as simple as what was Stephen pre presented or, you know, but I think that that is needed for that, for the group. From my observation of that meeting. Darcy. Um, I guess I'm a little confused as I thought the Article 5, which I assume is the debt one, yeah. um, was not amendable. So are we, if we are looking for alternatives, is it just something to go back to the state board with as proposed, so different, uh, to propose change in that to them before they hit us with it? Like, I don't know. I, I, that's where I'm, I'm kind of confused about that. So there, there is a provision uh, in the, the default, the draft default articles of agreement uh, that allows for uh, districts that are forced to merge to opt to form a committee, essentially a 706 B committee, to draft its own articles of agreement uh, separate from what's in the draft default articles of agreement. And uh, there's some fairly tight uh, time frame for, for doing that and, and trying to get it approved. Basically, it would require uh, the state board approving uh, those articles. Uh, it's only meeting, which is in play, I think, given the timeline, is probably January 17th is when they will meet. Um, and then we'd have to have, have schedule one and schedule and have a vote of the electorate 
on whether or not to approve those articles of agreement or not. So essentially, there's a kind of very narrowly defined opportunity for us uh, to, uh, as distant boards, uh, to draft our own articles of agreement, uh, which could, the content could be quite different um, from what's in the, the default draft articles of agreement with the proviso that the state board has to approve. Uh, so, uh, if a 706 B has to be formed, does that have like what's the time period? I guess I'm sorry, maybe you answered that, but uh, being on the deck committee, I just want to understand that there's two groups working on potential articles, right? We're working on focus on one, uh, but if that committee has to be formed, when would that have to be formed? Well, it can be formed, I think, any time really, but but probably I'm. I'm climbing farther and farther out of the limb here. <laughs> so in terms of whether I may be right about this or not. And my sense is that it could be formed, probably should be formed if it's going to be as soon as possible after this, the uh, state board issued its statewide plan. And then there is a kind of nine day ticking time clock limit on you know, when we'd be able to, to kind of vote to have the voters uh, vote on draft articles. So it would be after the, the final decision? We had some discussion about whether we could uh, form one earlier. We don't answer. We would have hoped. Yeah, yeah, we don't have an answer. We, we were asking that question. Thank you. Yeah, well, so uh, I generally I agree with what Bill said. At first, I thought this discussion was helpful with what Stephen said, but I think now I'm walking in the other direction here because it's still not clear whether this board wants the committee to identify a solution that this board considers equitable or that is going to work with law or with the law. And those are those appear to be two very different things. We can we can brainstorm um, solutions that this board might deem acceptable bring them back to the board and then go from there, the executive committee or the articles committee or the SC board can go from there as far as uh, exploring what is within the law. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do those two things with, it, with the time that we have. I guess I now can float a suggestion. Uh, it really is just that. Would it make sense for the, uh, the debt subcommittee to uh, to bring three alternative uh, Article Fives, draft Article Fives, to our December fifth SU meeting? Um, understanding that, as you say, there may not be any alternative that's going to sort of tick every box that has to be ticked. But you know, maybe by just saying like, well, let's look at these three and. Uh, list out what the pros and cons or the challenges are, you know, with them. Uh, at least that we have something to discuss and look at. Uh, again, that's just a suggestion. Yeah, we can do that. So, I think part of what we were instructed at that committee, because they were just going to focus on that, was I had read that email that Edie sent us about maybe trying to ask them to, because we know that on Article 5 it says that neither the board of the voters can amend this article unless it's within the law. So we've been around a couple of times with the lawyers, so what, what you were saying, I think it's right that we could ask them to come to an alternative way, even if it means that we will be involving the legislation to to be amenable. So come up with something, even if it's not within the law, that we can float through. So so be creative. I don't, you know, yeah, just be creative. Yeah. <laughs> Think outside the box. <laughs> but. Scott. Do we know? Um, yeah, I'd just like to remind us all of what everybody already knows is that um, equity is actually the number one goal of Act 46, at least in the, in the presentation, order of the presentation. And I think arguably in order of importance uh, in the case of conflict. And clearly, in this particular 
instance, we have a conflict between Burns and 946 and in trying to, to put together an emerging. So um, that's where we are. Yeah, and I think that the, 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 the sort of uh, impetus for, for forming a subcommittee on this issue is exactly that there's a lot of naughty questions involved. You know, and nobody really knows how to square this circle. Um, and we, as the larger group that we are, you know, could probably talk endlessly about it and you know, end up at the same place. So our, our dear hope is that this smaller group of folks their laser intellects to uh, come up with some some alternative. And I understand it's um, it's not a fun or easy chart. I get that. Yeah. So I, I guess the question is whether we need to formally adopt a charge. Do we need to word it? And like, we can. I, I'd be I'd be happy to make a motion if people are comfortable with what I said. I'll try to word that into a motion. Um, so I guess I would move that we charge the. Subcommittee on uh, debt um, to uh, present um, three alternative options uh, for um, Article 5 language uh, at our December 5th WCSU meeting. Brian, a second. Is there any further discussion? The other piece I would say that in the uh, last week's state board meeting, Brad James gave some modeling that he's updating. He realized that those figures weren't absolutely correct, so he's actually called back to us and asked for more data. Uh, but it's just for all the towns that are looking at merger. Uh, there are other towns that have tax rates affected. We're one of the highest, but not the highest. What I saw from his data at the end of the state board last week. So Karen, I think your comments are well taken. I know the committee has been discussing issues of data, and I, I guess to kind of make, there's an implicit assumption that any effective presentation of the alternatives probably has to involve, you know, some figures and implications and you know, things like that. Along the same line, I think the assets and liabilities and sort of business analysis is important. But really getting to the heart of what Karen was, was saying is 
a way to, uh, you know, grid out, like, what does this mean for my household? I pay X number of dollars in taxes every year on my property, between my school tax and my, however it works, you know, and then I'm either income adjusted or I'm not to some degree, and, and what does that mean? So that instead of this huge, scary swirl of numbers that we don't know, and this is something that we did, East Montpelier has some pretty direct experience with this because we took on a huge amount of debt. Um, and, and one of the things that made it less unknown for the taxpayers in East Montpelier was to give some really direct, clear numbers. This is what this will mean for you if you make you know, X number of dollars in your household and you have a $150,000 homestead. It'll translate to a lift of this many dollars in taxes per year. Um, and having that actual hard data is really important when we're talking about decisions like that. So. I would also hope that one of those models or a fourth model would be if we had to merge what that would look like with the same amount of detail so that we would have something to compare it to. Yes, I, I do want to close out discussion of this pretty soon because we have some other critical things to get to. Bill, is it reasonable that we have numbers by the time that debt subcommittee is formed? And is there any other participant of that committee from your office that would be useful that would have numbers that the committee could use when trying to make meaningful calculations about how to form? So the first thing I said, we're waiting for the audits to come back. So we have FY17, FY18 data. Right now I'm running on FY17 data. And that's one of the problems with the models that we produce is we're a year, usually two years back. So I'm waiting for the audits to come from the auditor. We've been told by the auditor that we'll be here by the end of this week. Because I want audited figures. On audited figures, Lori's really good. And she, her team is really good at what they do, and they get everything put together pretty fast. Um, from there, it's, you know, it's not going to be calculating at the table. That we, Lori and I, usually do not like to do that because we make mistakes. We'd rather be asked for the information, go do it. We use a third person in the office to double check all our work and then bring it back. So I guess I just want to ask quickly, uh, Bill, since you brought this up forward, does the charge as described uh, sound like it's adequate to uh, your concern? Uh, for me, it was just knowing, having some, a direction for the group. And that's all I was looking for because I think without it, um, we had a tough time finding a direction at that table. I guess my last comment would be that uh, you know I share everyone's hunger for precision and uh, you know objectively verifiable data on what's going to happen. Um, but I think this is a more complex situation even than. Montpelier was wrestling with when it was doing its uh, going through that process. Um, so I just wanted, I guess I just want to prepare folks for a likely some degree of frustration uh, with it and some some uh, forgiveness in advance for our county members because they're in a really tough place. So, um, okay, is there any, any other critical uh, discussion of the motion? Uh, again, so the motion is for the uh, debt committee to present three alternatives uh, to Article 5 to the SU board at its next meeting, December 5th. Um, we're ready to vote. I'll ask if uh, all those in favor of the motion please signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Um, at this point, I'd like to ask if there's uh, if any guests who came specifically with something they wanted to say about Act 46, because at this point, I don't anticipate returning uh, to that topic. It's a normal area of discussion. Uh, 
Now we have other things to get to on the agenda, um, soon monitoring report and discussion of educational goals, things like that. So, but there, there are even more to speak on, but I'm not sure you do that. If you could just, if it's possible to take, let's say, 90 seconds or less to please, please, uh, please identify yourself with you. Thanks. Here you go. You can do this one. My name is Charlie Nerman. I went to Scott to the uh, meeting down in uh, the SDE meeting. And Carol, the one guy who voted against the notion of merger here, was very uh, explicit in pointing out that the debt issue is not simply a matter of winnowing down to what the tax impact will be on individual houses. The contrary, the law is a question about the size of the debt. So I'm hopeful that you bear that in mind. Because quite frankly, I think it's winnowing it down to the impact uh, of a penny to the dollar for $100 of value is a good way of masking the uh, inequity uh, that is involved in transferring um, tens of millions of dollars of debt to uh, various people. So quick bear that in mind. It's important to John Carroll, which should be important to you.
I wanted to share some context with you before we get ready to share the student achievement data. And, um, and the first thing that I want to remind you of as we get ready to flip the slide is that Um, to bring into the room is the mission statement that the full board adopted two and a half years ago. It is right there. I think that you're familiar with it. I wanted to let you know that we are um, very familiar with it as educators in the system, that it really is driving all of the work that we're doing from pre-K through graduation. So first and foremost, that mission statement is informing our work. The student learning outcomes um, are really the way that we're operation, operationalizing that, uh, that mission statement. And I wanted to let you know that, again, all of the work that we're doing when we get together across the supervisory union to engage in teaching and learning collaboration to, uh, together is grounded in these student uh, learning outcomes, both the core knowledge standards and the transferable skills. And also, it is this year's current junior class that is required to graduate with proficiency-based graduation requirements. So we've been working hard to do this work pre-K through graduation so that we can lay a strong foundation for our youngest learners and then build all the way through. And we're definitely feeling a sense of urgency right now because our uh, current juniors are graduating in three semesters, about a little more than three semesters, under this new system. So there's other context that informs our work as well. One is the theory of action that the leadership team established a few years ago. And you are familiar with that theory of action. You've seen the implementation report and the strategic objectives that we've created. That work has also allowed us to organize um, organize the work and the learning that needs to happen in the system in order to realize that theory of action. So we spent a lot of time working on the establishment of clear learning targets, being able to really art, uh, explicitly articulate what it is that students need to know and be able to do. We want to make sure our students know those as well. We want, to know, we want them to know why what they're learning is so important and how it relates to the learning that will come down the line. We're focusing a lot on high quality instruction in interventions and you will see um, some of the thinking that we're doing right now as we analyze our student data. And, um, and then along those same lines, the comprehensive and, and balanced assessment system, you'll see the pieces that exist, and you'll see that there are um, pieces that don't yet exist. You all spent a day learning from the DMG about recommendations for effective and efficient practices in special education that I would argue are effective and efficient strategies for all children. It's incumbent on us to meet all of our students' needs, and we have a collective responsibility to do so. So some of those recommendations in the, in the report with which you are familiar are informing our work as well. And then finally, I'll talk about this a little in just a minute or two, that um, the Agency of Education's uh, work to, to monitor school quality as well. And the annual snapshot, which is the quantitative part of their monitoring process. Um, you, I hope, remember that uh, recently we participated in a pilot with an integrated field review, and there were recommendations from that as a more qualita qualitative uh, visit and aspect of the work, but I want to share with you just a little bit of about what to expect with that annual snapshot. So tonight you're going to see some sources of data that we've used to, um, to report to you on our student progress. You will see our most recent um, SBAC score, Smarter Balanced Assessment, SBAC measures literacy and mathematics. You'll also see um, sort of a, a combination of our local assessment data in our youngest grades, uh, kindergarten through third grade. We use a benchmark assessment in literacy, which is called the Fountas and Pinnell, or FNP, as we affectionately refer to it. You'll also see in grades four, five, and six, we use the um, developmental reading assessment, uh, second version, or the GRA2. And then we have a universal screener called STAR 360 in reading as well. We administer to our students between grades three and 
10, so we have an assessment that transcends each of those major transitions. Um, and in mathematics, we administer Star 360 as well, and we administer that assessment grades uh, 1 through 10. And then you'll see report card data as well. So we spend some time aligning report cards to our student learning outcomes in a very intentional way. And um, ultimately, teachers use their professional judgment and student work to, um, to create uh, scores, to give students scores that are a reflection of their summative performances. So all of that data is used to triangulate, and the importance of triangulating data can't be underscored. Any one source of data um, is one snapshot, one view of student performance at a particular point in time. When we look at multiple sources of data that are intended to measure the same um, knowledge and skill set, then we can understand more deeply how our students are doing. Teachers can respond to that data at the individual school, uh, individual student level. They can respond at the classroom level. We can make some school goals and priorities, and then we can look at our assessment results as a system as well. So when you see the results um, as they exist right now that Bill's going to present to you in just a little bit, you'll see the SPAC, the Star 360, Fountism and now the GRA2, and um, an uh, analysis of our current report card work. So there, um, you're gonna see a lot of data and you're gonna be asked to draw some conclusions yourselves, but um, it is super clear that we have had for a long time and continue to have an achievement gap between our students who are historically underserved and those who are historically privileged. And we are defining that achievement gap in two ways. One, by students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, and those who don't, and also students who have individualized education plans or require special ed services, and those who don't. So um, you will be asked to consider that data and what it means for our future action. We also, um, we did a lot of work to align our report cards to our student learning outcomes, but we have a lot of work to do, I think, across the system in terms of calibrating our practice, looking at um, student work together and determining uh, what, what, what that means a student knows and is able to do and how we would uh, summarize or, and score that data across the board. So we've engaged in some conversations about that in the supervisory union, either at um, our curriculum camp experiences in June and sometimes when we have the opportunity to get grade or subject alike teachers together, mostly during in-service days, occasionally on Wednesday afternoons, but that is work that um, that is deep and critical and, um, and we still have a ways to go, I think, in that work. We have some local assessments um, in literacy and mathematics and then there are areas in our student learning outcomes where we have no common assessments, whether we've created them here or we've looked outward um, and that's, that is um, not good enough yet. So we have work to do in, in other areas as well. And um, let's see, again, I mentioned the district management group's plan. We're doing a lot of work um, specifically with our case managers right now around um, enacting or preparing to enact some of the practices that were highlighted in that report. And also at a school and systems level when we're looking at how we structure um, time and expertise and allocate those resources. And then finally, um, the most important thing is to have a high quality teacher in the classroom who is engaging in effective practice and with his or her students um, as much as possible. So we're looking for ways to do this really important work um, in a way that's not going to pull our teachers away from their students. The other thing I just wanted to share with you, and this goes back to the annual snapshot, is just a little more context about the state of Vermont. So, you know, with the federal legislation, um, ESSA, or ESSA, or the Every Student Succeeds Act, Vermont created a statewide plan to meet the requirements of the federal legislation. As recipients of federal funds in Washington Central, we are also required to follow that plan. And so there have been a few changes. In December, the state is going to receive, uh, reveal or release the results of the annual snapshot. 
and we're going to get um, we're going to get a nice set of data to look at. The one domain that um, that we're sharing with you tonight is academic proficiency. There will be changes down the line. The state is exploring ways to enact these assessments. So SBAC has been around for a little bit. Um, it used to be grades grade through eight and grade 11. And the state changed grade 11 to grade nine in part because um, we weren't getting particularly reliable or valid results from 11th graders. And there was a, um, a strong suggestion to, to test ninth graders instead. So SBAC does transcend uh, elementary, middle, and high school. There's a new assessment in science. It is aligned to the next generation science standards. We piloted it as a state last year. We are not going to receive individual student results this year, but we will test in May with this test, the Vermont Science Assessment. It's a test um, of grades five, eight, and 11. It is rigorous, and I think it's going to cause us to look at um, what we do and don't do yet in science instruction in our supervisory union. And then finally, um, Fitness Graham is an assessment of physical education. Our PE teachers have actually been administering Fitness Graham for years as a measure of strength and flexibility and aerobic capacity for our kids. Fitness, so that wasn't a huge heavy lift for us. We piloted it last year across the state and, um, and we will implement Fitness Graham as part of the school accountability measures this spring. And the state, after the pilot results, has determined that it's grades four, seven, and nine that will um, we'll be participating in Fitness Graham. And finally, something that you're gonna see that is relatively new in the annual snapshot is the state is, um, is enacting its commitment to equity by calling out and sort of scoring uh, schools on how they're doing uh, with groups that have historically been underserved or marginalized and students who haven't. And so we'll get some official results about the equity index. So we'll see that difference between performance and student groups. And we will also, over time, um, be assessed on what, how, how well or not we are closing that gap. So um, that is, in my mind, um, really important and critical work. I'm thrilled that it's going to be public and that it will help us to continue to engage in that discourse. So um, before I present about the data, I wanted to celebrate some great things. We've made some huge changes in our assessment and data system from last year. And it's not so much the assessments themselves, but we have a lot more data than we did before. For the first time, um, we now have the ability to ask better questions in our system. And the cornerstone of that is the proficiency-based scoring system that we have. We are now able to look at, as I said in my report, uh, what is being assessed and reported to parents and what is the written curriculum? And we'll show you some evidence of that tonight. We're also able to uh, really start to triangulate on what our, what our quantitative data is saying, and we're able to do that and then go look at what our qualitative data, what the stories that we're hearing from students and from teachers about what's happening in the classroom. Um, with those qualitative data, we're really starting to look at what the how and why we're getting the results we're getting. And I'm gonna show you some of that tonight as well a little bit, but we know we have a lot more work to do in that area. So it's really exciting to have this. Uh, from last year, if you remember, we were only able to look at three grade levels. So that makes a big difference in having that same, to having that proficiency-based report card system. So this is our first slide. I'm trying to figure out where to stand so I don't get in everyone's way. Uh, of triangulation. So we're able to look at the literacy data, um, both from uh, our report cards, our local assessments, uh, which Janet reminded everyone that's Fonson and Pinnell, our DRA2, STAR 360 reading, and then the SBAC assessment. You'll note up here that the report card data is lower than our local assessment and our SBAC, but when we look at our literacy data compared to the state means, and state averages, our literacy data by grade level is achieving above the state average in all grades. 
So uh, this makes me wonder, uh, do our teachers have higher expectations for our students in literacy than the other two assessments? That's one of those qualitative questions we want to really find out. We also know that um, about seven, eight years ago, the supervisory union put a big push into literacy professional development for most of the teachers of literacy. So this is just breaking it up by grade level, and you'll see the SFAC perfect, uh, percent proficient, and you'll see both a fall and winter literacy. This next year, we'll actually have a spring that all students will take. Um, the past couple of years in literacy, we did not have a score that was happening at the end of the year. Um, so our winter assessment's happening in January and December. Got that right? Yeah. When is it? Yeah. December, yeah. yeah, December and January, and the fall happened right as school start. Uh, so you can see some growth on this, as well as how it compares to the SBAC performance. This is our gap analysis. So you'll see on the left hand side, it took sixth grade. We could look at different grade levels. I can't look across grade levels when I do a gap analysis. I have to do a gap analysis within a grade. Um, because of the performance targets and the scales which the kids are, uh, are scoring at. So as you see on the left hand, you see free and reduced lunch and non-free and reduced lunch. The gap there is 53 scale points, which is almost a year and three quarters of learning. For our students that are, and remember use free and reduced lunch as an indicator for poverty. If we look at students that are on, I, that have an IEP, and for those who do not, you will see that we have a gap of 95 scale points at sixth grade. That's almost three years of learning. Back to the triangulation now we're at math. So this is our local common assessments, uh, our report card, and our SBAC. And last year when we showed you this, you saw two bars, the local report card, and the local assessments much higher than the SBAC. The great news is we've been able to, to get those in to where our local assessments now are in alignment with our SBAC scores. So the teachers, the scores the teachers receive right away from our benchmark assessments are in alignment. The place that is in alignment right now is our report cards. And Jen talked about calibration earlier. Our report cards are about 50% higher than the local assessments. So the information that the teachers uh, assessing the student on. So it's a place right now that one of the things we want to ask is how do we help to calibrate our report card expectations with that of our local assessments and the Common Core? So the report card and for all the parents who are using the portal is in more frequent reporting back to them about how their child is doing. Very similar to literacy, I took the STAR 360 here again and looked at it with SBAC performance. You'll notice that um, we actually have a range in here of positive six to negative two with differential from the winter assessment to the SBAC performance. Um, and so it's, it's really, it's much tighter aligned, which is giving us much better information. If we look at sixth grade math performance, disaggregated by poverty and students who are, received, uh, who are on an individual education plan, on the left-hand side, again, the same format, you'll notice that there's a 43 scale point difference for students that are uh, on free and lunch and those who are not, so that's about a year and a half worth of math. And for those who are on IEP, there's 98 scale points lower, so approximately three years, again, below um, in the performance or the gap. Bill, can you just tell us, what's the black line across the middle? The black line is the proficiency line Got it. for that grade level. And I, I wonder a little bit about the free and reduced why it looks the way it does, because those have been lower. Looks like she hires. I'm gonna look at that one more time, boy. So one of the things we can do, and if you look at my blog, as I said to you in my memo and to you uh, in my report, there's a lot more information you can go to the blog and look at. So I pulled out literacy, and this is literacy scores at 
six or eight. So if I came over here to the poster, you'll see in literacy there are six standards here that are, that are written into the written curriculum. So while the order isn't quite the same, you can see the, now we can see the performance of students via meeting those standards at that grade level. All our content committees have written performance indicators at each of those grade levels so that we know, so the teachers can judge, are they beginning to meet expectations, progressing, are they meeting or exceeding expectations? So as you look at this, the teachers can now take back this data as a group when they look at their curriculum for adjustments. One of the things Jen and I have been talking about is where do we have the time for teachers to get together and use this data to inform their curriculum path with their students. Jen, you want to go to the next one? This next one is math at sixth grade. And as you see, if you look up here, there are five standards. And I show four up here on this graph. And the reason for that, the functions standard what grade level is that? It's eighth, eighth grade. It does not even start with a performance indicator in eighth grade. But you notice we have no assessed data. I'm not saying kids aren't getting learning opportunities, but there are no assessments for geometry or statistics. And that's called for in our If you look over to the next slide, Jen, you'll notice that the teachers have written performance indicators for the sixth grade for geometry and statistics. So we do not have assessed information on our students at that level. So the question, the, the next question that ha happens is, for me, is it not whether we have to have them all, but what does that do for the student's ability to learn math? And is it, there, there's probably prioritization. I know for me and I were in the classroom back in my teaching days, and I look at that, I'd say the number and quantity in the algebra has some priority over the geometry and statistics, or it may be something else that's causing that as well. We'll get to in a minute. So you can go on to the next. I took a, I went down to fifth grade, and I'm sorry I didn't stay with sixth grade on this, but it was just an easier way to get the data. We're also, if you look at these X marks, and you look at the elementary schools, and you look at the standards, I only brought three content areas, you can see we're nicely aligned in literacy this is data of where teachers have scored students. So they scored students, all the elementary schools of literacy, and the five standards all across the board. And that's what was called for in the performance indicators. When I went to math, they scored in three of the four that were called for, but they were all in the same place. When I went to science and I stopped at science and I wanted to see if this was true, it was enough to say, hey, not all the elementary schools are scoring in the same places. So when I, I get really excited about this because I love, I really like looking at data and doing this analysis. I run into Jen's office and I say, hey, look at this. And she goes, I got one thing for you. They're in different grade configurations. So they're not teaching the same thing necessarily. So there's a lot more looking to do. We need to get the teachers together to ask the question, is this okay or is it not? I don't know the answer to that. On to some uh, high school performance data, kind of the end of the pre-K graduation career for Washington Central. And it's, here's our graduation rate. Um, right now, currently, we're not getting, and I should say this with all the data, um, the Agency of Education has not come out with their SBAC data or their other accountability data. They're not doing that until December, as Jen talked about their annual snapshot. I sat through a presentation last week um, at the Superintendents and School Boards Conference. They're trying not to have it be comparative between school or districts. So we will not, when you say, so how do we compare to the average? I can't tell you. Okay, well, they're, they're, not, they're not giving us that data. Um, so you will see this is our graduation rate up to last year. Next slide. One of the other things we did, if you remember, I had the nice smiley faces in previous years about, grad, about college, um, admit, college admissions and college acceptance rates. We are now in the state of Vermont, as Jen referenced earlier, we're using the annual snapshot and it will take data from other places. The National 
clearinghouse for school bit for data is giving us indicators of what's actually happening with students as long as they go to college in the United States, so it doesn't give international. We know we all have some students that are up in Canada and uh, over in Europe for college. It also won't give us, um, it'll give us some career, college and career ready data, so it'll give us data for Vermont labor and Vermont trade schools. But we are changing to this data because the data that I had done the previous years for all of you was things we collected only in U32. So this is much more uh, reliable and valid data from the National Clearinghouse. Of, and this is a graduate, so it's not a four-year cohort, it's just the graduates from the senior class. So you only need to be at U13 for one year, I believe, is that right, Stephen? To, to be in this data set. You didn't have to be here for all four years as what the previous data set was. So you will see um, what students are reporting in the blue for going to college and accepted to college. That's student report. And then coming from the National Clearinghouse data is who's actually enrolled. You can see we're, we're averaging around 58%. We have one year that's an outlier, a little bit of an outlier at 74. And our students do really well. One of the things we hear around the state is that Vermont students do not stay in college. Uh, and I've heard numbers lower than 50%. Uh, but to see that that's averaging in the around 74, 75 percent, and then the per, so that's called the persistence rate. Excuse me. <coughs> and then the completion rate is completing the college experience within six years. a really quick question. Uh, does complete get checked if somebody goes through a two-year versus a four-year versus a... I think so, Steve, right? So, okay. so the data we got from the state is a little more limited, so I think that that's just the four-year completion rate, um, but the two-year, um, if, if we actually pull all the clearinghouse data, which we have not done, which we're going to do now, it will show us two-year and four-year college completion rates, um, as well as um, in the, some of the independent trade at schools as well. There's some, there's some other data we can pull, but we just don't have it yet. And that, that's part of, Vermont had to sign an agreement, right, Stephen, so with the National Clearinghouse, I believe, to get some access to this. Yeah. So, um, so, on to actions. That was a new part of the report this year were actions that we were going to take. And so Jen, if you can go on to the next one. So Jen mentioned a lot of these. Um, I'm going to reiterate them again. So one of the things that we're doing, and I'm going to hold the top one, the goal setting, to the last part. Um, but supporting all our learners. There's, I know that Jen and Kelly have been working with a special educators a lot of as you heard from our work with the district management group that specializing our special educators into content areas which they instruct so they've been working on more depth of instruction in literacy and math um, we've expanded a little bit of math interventions at one school uh, but we're seeing already in our data, data that we probably need more of that i know that that's always a constant uh, conversation about the capacity we have for interventions um, uh, we need to audit our math instructional time. One of the things that we know is that we're not all our students are seeing 60 minutes of math every day for math instruction. As we do in literacy, and this is one of the things that happened in literacy about eight years ago, um, is that we changed to ensure that we had 90 minutes of literacy instruction for all students. The, I had mentioned earlier the audit of the written curriculum with the assessed curriculum, and our teachers need to look at that and sit down and say, what does that tell us for what kids need, and how might we alter our scope and sequence of what kids are learning. And the last part, which I want to thank the board for, is the math goals. 
you had given us the working with school quality committee, you had asked for a math goal to be set, and your leadership in asking for that has asked, has required us to ask all the math teachers, all the instructors of math to say, since they know their kids the best, not the, any of us as a member of the leadership team, where do you think your kids, based on where they are now, where will they be in June as measured by the STAR 360 math assessment? So in the past three weeks or four weeks, the principals have worked closely with their teachers to look at that data, to build targets based on what they believe their students will be able to do. And what they have come up with is that for Washington, you see this by school, uh, and it's in the report as well, but for Washington Central, currently as of the September assessment, we had 45% of our students proficient. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and our goal for the June administration is to have 71% of our students proficient. Along with that, we decided to have, a, and we had much of discussion about this, do we need a growth goal? Because Star 360 will show us how much growth a student makes within a year, as well as their attainment or achievement, so that the combined across the supervisory union that 90% of our students will at least will grow at least one year's worth of growth. So next, I gave you all a card or you should have grabbed one when you came in, or you need one if you don't have one that looks like this. On the, and this is similar to an activity I do with the teachers at the beginning of the year, but a little different. So take a look at this image. I'm gonna give you three or four minutes. We're gonna ask for quiet in the room. We're gonna ask the audience not to have side conversation. We're really gonna ask the leadership team to be quiet back there. Tell me what this image Take a minute, write it out, write some poems. What does this image mean to you?
So in a few minutes, we're going to be in groups. And you may want to share what you wrote on that card. But let me tell you what this image means to me. This image means to me, in order to provide equity, we need to make sure everyone can pick the apple. Doesn't matter to me what the ramp looks like, or how it's constructed, or who builds it. What matters to me is that each person is able to get the apple. In the concept, context of what we've just observed in the student learning data, we need to ensure that all children can reach that apple. That is to be successful in literacy, math, and social emotional learning. For many years, we've been talking about the inputs of the system and what would help to provide equity. If we only talk about the inputs of the system, then to me, we're only focusing on some sort of equality. And equality, to me, is not the same as equity. Not only do we need to focus on what the ramp looks like, but we need to focus on does it provide the support for each and every student. For me, it has become clear. We need to switch our conversation from the inputs to the outputs. Equity means we do everything possible to ensure equity of outcomes, outcomes for all. Our excellent instructional system must focus on high quality, rigorous learning targets for all. Last week, and I've heard Dan French use it in the past two or three weeks, and I totally agree with him, you can't separate the conversation between quality and equity. For some inst education institutions, and for some states, They've achieved equity by lowering standards. That's not what I'm talking about, and that's not what I believe. By providing the same high quality outcomes to all students, we'll be giving the best strategy we can to lower our poverty and racial gaps we have in our towns, in this great state of Vermont, and in the nation. So I believe it's our moral imperative to do it. That's gonna ask us to ask ourselves some challenging questions. What are we willing to change? We've been nibbling around the edges for years in Washington Central. And if we aren't willing to really change the system, I don't think we'll be able to change the equity gap. Are we, able to, are we willing to change the length of the school day, the school year, change our school schedule, increase the number or decrease the number of students in classrooms, Change our teaching structure so we have content specialists. A variety, change our variety of courses we offer. Fewer variety of courses, more. Are we willing to ensure success for all students? I heard the board struggle from East Montpelier's challenge about asking for a guarantee. Use what word you want. I like the word ensure, use guarantee. But you as a board have to decide whether you're willing to promise something to the kids. Are you willing to do it? Ellen, I really need to work here with the board. So, I really like Albert Einstein. For those of you who've been in my office, you know I'm a former physics teacher. This actually isn't sure that this came from Albert Einstein. If you look at it on the web, they're not sure if it came from him but he's attributed to it anyway, all over the place. But I really believe in this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and again and expecting different results. So I'm gonna ask you to get you to go to your colored table groups. The leadership team will come with you and join you. We're gonna have notepads, and I know we don't have a lot of time, Matthew, but I'm going to ask you to extend it by 15 minutes because I think this is so important that we do. There needs to be a report out. And that you know, we answer the interesting questions. Kari and I worked on them together as part of the school quality. We changed them from last year. What's your reaction to the information in this report? What is something in the report you're proud or excites you? And what change would you be willing to do?
good enough. Yeah. What surprised you? What are you proud of or excites you? And what are you willing to change? What's your reaction? Yeah. We're all in the committee. Yeah, so we should, so that's, I, that's what I was saying. It would be nice if we would have the action out. Proud. Change. You're really sorry. You're supposed to. you got to find a table. Let's do something for us to be proud of. It's only go, it's going to make our jobs easier where the gaps and holes are. If we can yeah, I think so. One reaction I had is when we look at, say it's sixth grade trends across, um, I wonder how that will change as sixth grade teachers from all schools get to talk together and kind of calibrate their scoring. So I don't think that's happened a lot yet. It's happening it's just starting. So I wonder how much this data will change as they talk more and they align more across the district. There's something Bill said that I wanted to ask about, like grade alignment or something like that. Was he talking about the five, six, like combined classes and that type of right. stuff? So, so configuration so alignment. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Is that what he was talking about? And so you know, there at, at this moment, yes, you we are all right. And you know, there are, there's some places that live big, some with straight grades. There's some straight grades, but we're not even aligned in the grades that we combine. And how could you ever do that? Three, 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 four, I, three, three, four, five, year to year, I think there would be years. That bigger places and the interventions in place, and less than what, how much of the specials or other we, more engaging areas are right. willing to give up to get to the we had, we had that conversation in our board meeting a couple months back because, and I don't think it necessarily holds true at the elementary level, but, you know, when you're potentially taking something that keeps that kid in school to get any advantage, how, you know, how do you weigh that? How do you weigh taking away, taking away something that, like, I mean, I'm just going to use sports, but... That's about, you know, that like taking away a sport. Right. So that's keeping them at least engaged in the, the school. I mean, I struggled with it at the elementary level, and my point was, you know, I know that as a parent, I'm able to give my kid a lot of experience outside the school day, but I also know there are parents and that can't. And, you know, Bill's point was, well, but they're going to lose experiences in the future because of the gap. So I struggle. That's one thing I struggle with is, is letting kids be kids a little bit and yeah. not having that gap. Well, you can be like, so like not in this district, but okay. yeah, no, it's like you would often look at the class. You know, that is the opposite, opposite of what you need. You needed to get that energy yeah. out so you could focus and like so. But then you, I don't know if you do that anymore. I don't know. I'm sure no, you I'm can't speak to that. Well, he didn't get it. He, he wasn't in this district, so it's okay. Um, but those are the things that we have to kind of try to balance it. Like, yes, we need that intervention to try to get the student up and provide them the most that we can so they can be successful with it. But we also need to recognize that there's got to be some balance so that they can get the exercise they need and get that, that kind of energy out and help refocus. No, you don't want to do Yeah, and it has to be balanced. Please try to take something else from your conversation. I'm going to start over here at this table.
reaction was we were pleased that all of this data is being collected and used versus collected and put in a file cabinet. So it's being made public and appears to be being analyzed um, <coughs> using the data as a vehicle for change so that if more professional development or focus is necessary, that's happening. But also to be prudent and careful with its use. But we're pleased that it's being used um, for making changes. We also talked about the board role would be more of a um, approving a charge that came to us versus us micromanaging what it should be done kind of thing. If the experts are all being paid quite well and they can make some decisions, bring it to us. Whether it's a financial decision or a, a change in school day, as was mentioned, something like that would be what we saw coming to the board. Our reactions were surprised and uh, shocked by the gap analysis and the difference in years of learning. And really, for us, that means it's a call to action. And for changes, I'm just going to give the crowd an excitement because we didn't have a lot. Probably says something. Changes, uh, looking at what has worked elsewhere to close the gap. it for maybe there are certain students who have an extended period of time. We want to make sure that we have the content expertise people. And if you have to share that specialist interventionist among schools, perhaps uh, you come together to support the number of students you need at a couple schools that are close by. Um, and look further outside the school. We really feel like talked about how we are excited as well that um, we have this system of reporting it seemed to take a big step this year and it's really gratifying that it's actually being used um, to, to strive to improve 
one of the things one of the themes that came out was that we're interested in hearing more about the qualitative part, the, the experience that the students are having. Um, the report is um, definitely good on the quantitative side, uh, but, but there could be more. And then, um, like some of the other groups, it was, it's difficult to answer the question of what what should change, um, but we also said that everything needs to be on the table and that there's a, a sense of urgency about it. So in our group, uh, we didn't dive in deep in some of the questions as, as others, but um, our reaction was we weren't surprised. It's the same data that we've been seeing for more than a decade. Some stuff that we uh, were pleased about was the work around triangulization um, and trying to get alignment between the local assessments, the, the other assessments, and the report cards. Um, I, I, we didn't word it this way, but I think we were pleased seeing the um, beginning to see the closing of the gap at the U32 level. But that was good news, bad news, because then we were very disappointed that we weren't seeing that gap closing at the elementary school. And then understanding that to close that gap at the high school was causing students to have, to, um, have less access to um, learning opportunities outside of the basic core courses um, and feeling that we, we, we need to start doing a better job at the um, uh, some discussion on, I guess, reaction um, to the difficulty in trying to move the needle on factors that are outside of the school's control. Um, so, for instance, poverty. Uh, not that we wouldn't try to do that, but the increased difficulty that um, some of those disadvantages that students bring to school. And um, I think the other point might be it's you like the snapshots that we see and maybe there would be a possibility to take more snapshots. So for reactions, our group really focused around um, the testing and how it seemed like the local assessments were starting to align more with the SBACs, which was nice to see. Um, we talked about how the testing can vary day to day based on the student, and, and so that would need to be taken into consideration. Um, and also how grade configurations um, make all the elementary schools look really different, so the learning that they're getting is, is completely different. Uh, we were really proud, or we also talked, uh, which hadn't been mentioned yet, I think, about the, uh, we were pleased with the steady climb in the graduation rate. Um, that was nice to see. Um, we were happy that we're, we're getting to proficiency-based uh, learning assessments, um, that we have improved data, and that our SBACs are aligning with the local assessments. Uh, the changes, echoing what everybody else said, uh, we're you know, willing to discuss or think about anything. Uh, specifically, we talked about having the ability or having the desire to provide earlier interventions for students uh, into elementary school that could that could help ease the gaps as they get older, um, extending school days, making school years longer, or offering more summer type programs, um, even going as far as increasing staff to help uh, with that, and really just anything that could improve outcomes we were willing to consider. So thank, first of all, thank you for all of you for that work. Um, I'm gonna ask the, uh, the administrative detail to make sure this gets to Krista so we can type it up. We'll give it all to you by December at the latest. Um, but we'd like to be able to capture that and put it together in a document. Um, it's great to hear that, that a lot of things are, you know, everything's on the table. Uh, I know the leadership team and I, we've talked a lot about different things and um, we're very concerned time for instruction is not there. It, it's hard to learn when you don't, if you're not there for the instruction because of the time of the, time of the school day. Uh, that's one of the things that we're gonna, that I'm gonna ask the leadership team to do an audit the next month to 
exactly where is our time and our number of minutes for instruction um, and, and bringing that back to you. So, uh, Matt, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Bill, I just thank you and thanks to the leadership team for what I know were just hours and hours of work uh, put in not only to this presentation but also to the ones that the voting boards are going to be receiving uh, in just a few moments. So I just really want to express appreciation for that. Um, we do have one more uh, discussion item on our agenda which flows rather naturally from the presentation that we just saw, uh, which is to discuss. A goal that we committed to developing as part of our uh, WCSU wide goal number two around student learning. Um, I guess I, I'm just going to take, because we're very short on time, I'm going to take the liberty to say a couple of things about that and suggest a way that we might be able to uh, expeditiously kind of try to move forward on this, this topic. Um, so, we're to, to me, it feels like a unique moment in time uh, for our boards to be considering a goal uh, that we want to set to, to really set a bar around educational outcomes. Um, we've had a ton of discussion because of uh, what's been going on the last three years about uh, what's happening in the schools, what school performance means. Um, we established the School uh, Quality Committee, which has been doing a lot of good work analyzing the data that we interpreting that, you know, uh, looking at it. Uh, we've had the retreat where we got some, some ideas. We've had discussions around guarantees and where we may feel about that. The discussion itself has been rich and, and productive. Um, and we also are at, as we know, a crossroads in terms of uh, the future of the school system. Um, it seems to me that we have an opportunity, uh, whether we remain in a current government structure or uh, whether that changes and we have a, a single board going forward, we have a unique opportunity right now to draw a line in the sand about what we think the school should be achieving with regard to educational outcomes. And no matter what happens going forward, we're basically daring future boards uh, to come back and say, well, we're just gonna wipe that line out of the sand because uh, we don't care. So we have an opportunity to kind of influence and set the agenda for our school system going forward uh, with this. Uh, so what I'd like to suggest, and I do want to hear from, from Kari on this, but um, what I am hoping is that the, the School Quality Committee might be willing to take this up at its meeting in November, and come back to the SU meeting in December with a couple of recommendations uh, for goals to the, for the SU board to consider, uh, possibly adopting at that meeting, certainly at least to discuss them. I know we're out of time to do that tonight, so that's why I'm suggesting sort of approaching it that way. Uh, and I think I somehow ended up with all the microphones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You like control. Microphones. Like <laughs> so um, the committee will be meeting in November, and we're happy to talk about that. Uh, this was uh, our our thinking was shared in in the packet of the last um, SU board meeting. And I wasn't here, but I guess it didn't get explicitly discussed. But at, at our last committee meeting, we basically felt, having not seen this report yet, that we weren't in the best position to set the target, that actually we would be um, looking to the leadership team to make a proposal um, that would, would bring us significant improvement. All that's, all, that's, all that's what we left it at, is significant with them to interpret and us to respond to their interpretation um, for significant improvement in both um, math and literacy learning. Um, and, a, and a plan including resources needed over the short term and long term, one, three, or more years. Um, and so I think now that we have this report, we'll meet in November, we can, we can discuss that. We, we see this as, ha that it has to be iterative and in collaboration with the leadership team because they are the experts. Um, you know, we talk about the changes. They, they have, we need their best thinking when we consider what the changes are needed. Thanks. And I guess I would just give a heads up to this board that it will be on the agenda in December. So I hope we all come prepared to discuss and possibly uh, possibly act as we are so moved. Um, is there any, anything else that anyone is burning to say on this issue before we move on? Okay. Uh, is there
as far as reports to the board, I talked a little bit about the executive committee. We're, we're uh, meeting extra times to try to get a jump a little bit on the budget process. I think Bill has probably mentioned to most folks here uh, that he is aiming for maximum transparency in the budgeting process uh, this year and as much consultation as possible because of the sort of state of flux uh, that things are in. Um, so we're going to proceed kind of as we have in the past, but we're just trying to, again, schedule these extra meetings so that the executive committee has time to try to figure out um, early questions, how to present to the SU before the next meeting, um, and how to discuss it. Uh, there is no financial report this evening, I believe, is that what we have one right in there? It's yeah, yeah, okay. all right. Policy committee, we, did, we discussed, we can, I think negotiations are just getting underway, so we can talk about that next time. Um, the SBA, I think we can talk about next time as well, if that's okay. Um, so I, the, the, the only other thing remaining on the agenda here is the action item 5.2, which is to approve the policies as listed. Uh, we um, approved the first reading at our last meeting of these policies. Uh, is there anyone who would like to make a motion to approve these policies? Wendy, so moved. Like a second. Is there any discussion of these policies? There is no discussion. And all those in favor of approving these policies, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Um, are there any future agenda items other than the ones discussed already? OK. Are there any board comments? communication. In that case, we are 